All right, I want to call your attention to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23, and one verse, one verse, 2 Samuel chapter 23, and that verse is verse number 20. And it says, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kebzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors, and he also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. As I mentioned a moment ago, this is an assignment kind of word, and, and it may just be for a few of you, but there's something called the corporate anointing, that the anointing on all of us is greater than the anointing on a few of us. And I believe that this is a word for the corporate house from the Lord and is simply this, go for it. Look at somebody around you and tell them, this is our word. And tell them the word is to go for it. Now, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your sweet spirit. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. Open our hearts now, Father. Allow us to hear clearly from you so that we can move forward on assignment with purpose and with focus for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, I must admit to you, this is uh, arguably one of the most obscure passages in all of Scripture. I spent a lot of time growing up in church, and uh, I heard a lot of great Bible stories in Sunday school. I know uh, about all of the major characters in Scripture but I never, when I was growing up, heard much about this minor figure by the name of Benaiah. Now, if you are aware of David and David's story and even the cadre of incredible people that David had around him, then you might recognize Benaiah's name because Benaiah was one of David's mighty men. But in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we are introduced to Benaiah's origin story. Uh, I love origin stories. My kids and I, we're, we're big Star Wars people, big Marvel people. And I love it when, when the Avengers are assembled. But I also love the origin stories to understand the background of where these heroes came from. And such is the case when we look at this story about Benaiah in 2 Samuel 23. This is his origin story. This, this verse gives us insight into um, why he was ultimately selected to become one of David's mighty men in the first place. And his origin story is one of the most inconceivable yet inspirational passages, I believe, in all of Scripture because through it, God is clarifying who you and I are called to be. And in this season, while this is the, the best summer yet, while we're moving into the second half of this year, I believe that this is also what God is calling for us to do. And that's to go for it. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us what Benaiah was doing or where he was going. When he encountered this lion, we don't know the time of day that this happened. We really don't know even his frame of mind, but scripture does reveal his reaction. He encounters this lion, and instead of running away, he goes after it. He, he doesn't tuck tail and run, but instead, he goes in pursuit. That's relevant for us because truthfully, if we were to be honest, most of us spend our lives running away from the stuff that we are afraid of. Most of us forfeit our dreams and even the callings of God on the altar of fear or in a desire to be comfortable, in a desire to choose convenience. We often chase after the wrong things. Instead of going in the direction to which we're called, we choose comfort. Another way for me to explain this is that so many people spend their life playing not to lose. Instead of playing to win. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to be a frequent contributor on the Dr. Oz show. I was one of, one of the experts that would come on the show and would, would, would talk about and teach and share on different topics. And on one particular uh, episode, 
um, the production team, they said, we want you to come on and we want you to do uh, a talk and talk about purpose and how people can identify purpose and to live and to operate in purpose. And they said, so how do you want to do it? And I said, well, I would love to be able to do an exercise with the studio audience. They said, sure, what do you want to do? I said, here's what I want to do. I want to give, I want to give the studio audience three by five cards. And I want to ask the studio audience to write down what they would do if fear was not an option. And, that, and that's what we did. That's what we did. Uh, there was that segment, and uh, Dr. Oz introduced me, and he said that, that we're going to talk about purpose. And, and so we've got a, uh, an exercise. And I said, all right, I want everybody in the studio audience to write down on that 3 by 5 card what you would do if fear were not an option. What, what would you do? What would you go after? What, what would you pursue if you knew that fear was off the table? And it was interesting. There were a number of surprising responses. Some people said I'd be a singer. Some people said I'd be an actor. Some people said I'd start my own business. Some people said that I'd run for political office. And then somebody raised their hand and said, but, but help us understand what this has to do with purpose. And my response was, what you are called to do, your purpose is the thing you wrote down on that card. The problem is you are not living in purpose because you've allowed fear to have too much control over your life. The very thing that you said that you would do if fear were not an issue is the very thing that you are called to do. And you can enter into purpose the moment you set fear aside and begin to do it. I'm here this morning to, to maybe just talk to a few of you, but I suspect that this word is for many more than, than those of us that would like to acknowledge it right now. But the word of the Lord for you is quit running away from what you're afraid of. You are called to greatness. You are called into something bigger and beyond where you are right now. And the truth is, if you scan the pages of Scripture, if you take some time and just peruse the pericope of, of different books of the Bible, you will find that, that God often has a habit of, of using risk takers. You, you will find that, that often what, what you see is that God and his greatest moves happen on the backside of God's people pushing peer aside, fear aside and taking risks. In the text in front of us, Benaiah chases a lion into a pit on a snowy day. There are other passages. Think about Abraham who literally risked his legacy by placing his son Isaac on that altar on the top of Mount Moriah. But, but it was through that risk that he gets to know God as Jehovah Jireh. Nehemiah risked his comfortable position in the Babylonian administration to go back to his hometown and rebuild the walls. But the result is that he rebuilt the walls in record time. Esther risked her life to prevent the genocide of the Jews, but she comes to realize that that was the purpose for which she was called to the kingdom. The circumstances are all different. But the revelation and the lesson is the same. If you are willing to go for it, God is ready to move in some incredible ways. And so point number one is not just the title, it's the command. God called me here to tell you, number one, to go for it. Look at somebody around you and say that to them. Declare it. Go for it. This may be a word for your marriage. This may be a word for your finances. It may be a word for your business. It may be a word for your children. It may be a word for this dream that you have put on the shelf, but the word of the Lord is go for it. Why, Bishop? Well, because here's the thing. God is in the business of strategically positioning us in the right places at the right times. That God, God is, is a master at that. He strategically positions us. The Bible says that the steps of a good man and woman are ordered by the Lord. God literally strategically positions us in the right places at the right time. But here's the catch. The right places often to us seem like the wrong places. And the right times to us often seem like the wrong times. I mean, get this. Encountering a lion uh, in the wild. It's typically a bad thing. I mean, a really bad thing. My wife and I have been on safari in, in, in South Africa, 
And uh, I'm telling you, I don't want no parts of encountering a lion in any place. But so, so finding yourself in a pit with a lion on a snowy day generally qualifies as a terrible situation. But regardless of that, the Bible says that Benaiah doesn't run away. He goes for it. And then the result is when you drop down a few verses in 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verse 23, it says a few things. It says later on in the B clause of that verse, it says, and then subsequently David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Oh, you missed the revelation. This is the origin story. He encounters a lion and goes after it in a pit on a snowy day. Word travels around the kingdom. There is this dude named Benaiah who came upon a lion in a pit on a snowy day and didn't run. He went after it. David's like, yo, bring him to me. That's the dude I need on my team. And the Bible says, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. You still didn't get it. The promotion, watch this, was hidden in the problem. The elevation was, was hidden in the irritation. <laughs> Most people would have seen this 500-pound lion as a 500-pound problem, but not Benaiah. For, for most people, here's how we would have diagnosed the situation. Finding yourself in a pit with a lion on a snowy day, oh, that's a bad break. Oh, that, that's sure enough bad luck. But look at what God does. God takes what we define as a bad break and turns it into a big break for Benaiah. Could it be that what you are saying is bad luck is really God setting you up for something that he's been preparing for you since the day you were born? Could it be that the thing you say, oh, I don't want no part of that, is God saying that thing has got your name on it because the promotion is hidden in the problem? See, see, the, the reason you got to get this is because the Bible says that God is the ancient of days, which means that he works from the end to the beginning. So God has already gone on ahead of you and, and worked out your future. And then he puts it in reverse, drops it like it's hot, backs up, and meets us where we are. Now, this means then that God has a habit, listen to me, of using your past experiences and even your present problems to prepare you for future opportunities. God knows what is up ahead, but God knows that you will not be ready for what's up ahead if you haven't worked out the past and the present problems that you have. You missed it. God knows that there's a blessing up front, but God knows that you've got to get to a certain level of maturity in order to handle where he's taking you and the way you strengthen an exercise is God says, I got to give you some problems and some obstacles in your present and in your past because if you don't run from them, but if you learn from them and grow through them, they will prepare you for the blessing that's up front. Y'all look kind of quiet over here, so let me talk to you to give you some biblical example. I hope you remember then when David encounters Goliath. When David comes to the battlefield to check on his brothers, he finds that everybody, Saul and his men, are running away from Goliath. And, and David is like, what, what's the deal? Why are y'all running away from this uncircumcised Philistine? David says, I, I, I'll fight him. And Saul tries to put on his armor. And David says, I can't go but that. I've got to be uniquely myself. Give me my slingshot, my five new gnomes. And, and they're saying, but no, you cannot fight this man. He is ten times the, the size of you. He's too big. You, you don't have... Uh, combat readiness kind of training like we've had but David says but hold on now wait a minute in my past when I was shepherding my father's sheep I would encounter lions and tigers and bears and I had to learn how to fight the lions and the tigers and bears to take care of the sheep and he says and here's the thing the same God that helped me to fight the lions and the tigers and bears is the same God who will give me victory over this uncircumcised Philistine. I think y'all coming alive. What David is saying is I learned some stuff in my past when I was fighting lions and tigers and bears and so that same skill that I got in my past, God is preparing me now to take on Goliath. But here's the thing. These next level opportunities will often come disguised as Goliaths. They will often come disguised as lions. 
And this is why how we react is so important because how we react and respond to these lions will determine so much about what God does in our life next. We can cower in fear and run away or we can do like Benaiah and David did and say, we're going to go for it. And if I could be honest and clearly transparent for a moment, let me just put my life on display. As I, as I look back over my own life, I recognize this simple truth. The greatest opportunities in my life were the scariest of lions. And part of me, honestly, wanted to play it safe. But part of me, I'm, I, I, am, I, am a, I am a D, I'm a driver. I, I'm kind of one of those cats that has their life worked out. And I know I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. And, and that's the way that, that I lived much of my life early on. Uh, but I realized in walking with the Lord that taking no risk is really the greatest risk of all. Ah, oh, 20 plus years ago when I was finishing my, my master's, uh, I was in the graduation ceremony in, uh, on the campus of Morehouse College. And I remember my mother and my father were in the stands and my friends were there. And uh, we were going to have a barbecue at my uncle's house. It was going to be a great celebration of me completing my master's and getting accepted into a PhD program. And I was sitting in that graduation ceremony. And to be honest, y'all, I was depressed. I was depressed and I didn't understand it because I, I, I thought this should have been a joyous occasion. And I was sitting in that graduation ceremony in, in King Chapel waiting on my name to be called to walk across the stage. And, and I began to talk to God. I said, God, I don't understand. Why am I sad? And as sure as I'm talking to you right now, here's what Holy Spirit said to me. He says, it's because you've yet to live by faith. He says, everything you've done up until this point, you've played it safe. You, 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 made, you made calculated decisions that were your decisions, but they were not God decisions. And here's the thing. I was praying to encounter God, and I was praying to be a part of a move of God like never before. But God said, but you can't be a part of a great move until you let go of what you want to do, and you abandon safety and really trust me. And I'm telling you, the conviction of God fell over me in that graduation ceremony and tears began to run down my face and people around me thought they were tears of joy, but they were tears of conviction because I had to acknowledge to God that God, I hadn't really been trusting you like you've been calling me to. I've been playing it safe, but from this moment on, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to go after it. And I'm telling you, from that moment, it was like God put my life in hyperdrive. And door after door after door began to open and an incredible opportunity after incredible opportunity began to come. And can I tell you something? They were all scary. They were all nerve wracking. But those were the moments that I realized now that God was literally changing the trajectory of my entire life. I'm teaching to somebody this morning. You're moving into the second half of this year and the word of the Lord for you is, baby, you got to go for it because it's in the scary stuff. It's in the unknown stuff. It's in the nerve wracking stuff that you're facing right now where God is literally changing the trajectory of your life. This is why a lot of people sometimes get to the end of their life. One of the unfortunate things about being a pastor is that oftentimes we're called to sit with people at the end of their life as they are preparing to cross over into eternity. And one of the questions that I often ask is, do you have any regrets? And I've done this long enough that I started kind of compiling the data. And what I've noticed is that there are a number of people that get to the end of their life. And if they do have regrets, they really fall into two types of categories there is the regret of action that's when they wish man I wish I hadn't done that but then there's there's this regret of inaction where they wish that they would have done some things that they didn't do and this is a fascinating study uh, some leaders at Cornell University have actually studied this and what they have found is that most people when they get to the end of their life you know what they regret the most not not the the regrets of action saying oh man I wish I hadn't done that what they regret the most are the regrets of inaction the things that they wish they would have done that they did not do now to put this in theological terms I'm talking about um, omission versus commission the regret of, of, of action is, is the sin of commission. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. But the regret of inaction is the sin of omission. Oh, ah, I should have done that, but I didn't do it. Now, unfortunately, as believers, here's what we think. 
We often focus the most on the sins of commission. And what we think is, we think that we can be holy by subtraction. Oh, I didn't do that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, I didn't do that. Praise God. Oh, I showed them to do that. Ooh, did you hear they did that? Oh, I didn't do that. Hallelujah. No, we think that we can be holy by subtraction and we, we start comparing all the stuff we did not do. But I need you to understand that God is not just concerned about the sins of omission. He's also concerned about something else. He's concerned about all of the things that you could have done that you did not do. You can, you can do nothing wrong, listen to me, and still do nothing right. You can play it safe your whole life and God say, but you still miss the greater thing that I have for you because it's only going to come on the backside of faith. Let, let me show it to you in scripture. 2 Kings 13 and verse 14, it says this. It says, now Elisha had been suffering from the illness with which he died. And Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hand. And he said to the king of Israel, when he had opened it, here it is. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said. He opened it. Shoot, Elisha said. And he shot the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Armenians at Aphek. Then he said, now you take the arrows. First time, the man of God put his hands on the king's hands. This time he says, now, now you take some arrows. The king took them and he says, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, now you should have struck it uh, five or six times. You would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will only defeat it three times. Translation, he says, the first time I'm going to show you that I'm with you. So I'm going to tangibly put my hands on your hands. He had confidence when, when, when Elisha's hands were on his hands and he shot. And he's like, all right, I got the victory. Now Elisha says, now that you know that I'm with you, you ought to be able to demonstrate some initiative on your own. You ought to be able to have the courage to take those arrows and strike the ground. But instead of striking the ground multiple times, he only strikes it a few times. Isn't it interesting that when we sense that God is with us, we will take bold steps? But even when we move beyond that and we're supposed to know that greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world, we get comfortable and we get complacent. I'm teaching to some of you right now, you can look back over your life and recognize the, the moments where you say, okay, God, I sent your presence. I'm going to go for it. But then you've gotten to some places in your life where you've gotten comfortable. Well, you've gotten to some places in your life where you've got complacent and the same God that was with you then is with you now. And you ought to be at a place in your spiritual development where God doesn't have to give you chill bumps in order for you to move by faith. I'm teaching to somebody up in here. You ought to be at a place in your maturity where you've been walking with God long enough to know that if God said it, then he's with me and all I've got to do is trust that word and strike the ground. So God sent me here to tell you to go for it. But secondly, if you're going to go for it, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to ignore the odds. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to ignore the odds. This is a big one because, you know, we like to count it up to see, is it for us? Do we have what it takes? Do we have everything? Do we know the right people? Have we crossed every T and dotted every I? That wasn't the case with Benaiah. You know, scripture is kind of silent on whether or not he even had a weapon. And even if he did have a weapon, we know he didn't have a hunting rifle back then. This is, this is hand to paw combat. He's like, hey, I'm going to have to put these hands on you. You hear what I'm saying? But the point is, when you look at, look at lion against man, this is a physical disadvantage. A full-grown lion weighs hundreds of pounds more. Runs many miles faster, can leap higher than any man. A lion has, has vision that's five times better than any man with 20-20 vision. A lion has cat-like reflexes that gives him what he needs to, to pounce on prey in a pit on a snowy day. Given the fact that a lion is used to taking down giraffes and wildebeest and buffalo, Benaiah is like small prey. But the point is, Benaiah ignored the odds. He didn't focus on his disadvantages. He didn't make excuses. He didn't try to avoid situations where the odds 
were against him. But now you didn't say, you know what, Dr. Conway, I, you know, I, I, my, I, my spirit is not bearing witness with this. I'm sorry. He didn't say, you know, I just I, I need to spend a season of prayer and fasting so that I can get the word of the Lord. You know, he, he didn't say, you know, Dr. Conway, I, w- I would lead, but, you know, the ministry is just too small. And we need when we get more people, you know, then we'll really have what it takes. I don't have enough money in the bank to start the business. And so, you know, Lord, this must mean that it's not time. He didn't say all of that. He ignored the odds. He didn't focus on his disadvantages. Why? Because I believe that he keyed in on something. He recognized that God is bigger and more powerful than any problem that we will ever face in this world. And that's a word for us because we have to shift our paradigm. We have a tendency to look at things through the lens of do we have everything in our favor? But we have got to shift our paradigm and have the mindset that we can thrive in the toughest of circumstances. Why? Because we know that impossible odds, listen to me, set the stage for amazing miracles. You have to understand that, that it's the impossible odds that set the stage for God to reveal his glory glory like never before and when God reveals his glory that's when blessings fall down that never would have been ours if we had played it safe see there's this principle in scripture that I've discovered Pastor Matt after reading the Bible over and over and over again and it's simply this God does his best work and what we perceive to be our worst of situations that's the word right there. Thank you for the three golf claps like we had the U.S. Open. But, but, but God does his best work in what we perceive to be our worst of situations. I mean, God leads the nation of Israel through Moses out of Egypt. They come to the door of the Red Sea and the Red Sea's blocking them. Pharaoh's behind them. The mountains are beside them. And the people are freaking out. And Moses is like, God, what are we going to do? And God says, dude, just stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. Why? Because God does his best work in what appears to us to be our worst situations. Gideon, you think you got enough men, but you really got too many. I'm going to add to your life, Gideon, through subtraction. Send the majority of those men home. And I'm going to take the little and I'm going to do a lot. Why? Because God does his best work in what we perceive to be our worst situations you remember when Jesus is preaching he's got his tent revival going on and he gets word that Lazarus whom he loves is sick and the disciples think uh, we we need to go ahead and shut the revival down uh, Jesus and and Jesus just responds and says well his sickness is not unto death And he stays where he is several more days. And then when he finally gets to the home of Mary and Martha, Lazarus is dead. I mean, he's stinking dead. And I cannot prove this biblically. This is extra biblical. So preachers, this this is not Bible. But, but, But if you can read between the lines of scripture, I believe that Mary and Martha had a little bit of melanin in their skin. But because when Jesus gets to the house, they have an attitude. And it's it's a sister attitude. If you would have been here. My brother would not have died. And I love it because Jesus is just so cool and calm. He doesn't even interact with the attitude. That's a word for the men. Men don't play into the attitude. But but, but Jesus just says, just show me where you laid him. You'll see him again. She said, oh, I know, I know. I see him in eternity. He says, no, what you don't understand is who I am. You don't understand how big I am. You don't understand that I am the resurrection and the life. You don't understand that when you think it's over, that's just when I'm getting started. Show me where you laid him. Woo! He says, now Lazarus, you got to come out of here. <laughs> uh, because it doesn't matter that you're dead when you have the offer of life on your side. It doesn't matter that the door has been closed because God opened doors man cannot close. He says, Lazarus, come out. Why is this important? Because God often does his best work. And what we perceive to be our worst situation. You got to get this because you know what we do? 
we pray in a way that in many ways diminishes the power of God. When we pray, we spend so much time asking God to reduce the odds in our favor. Oh, God, we want you to turn it around. Turn it around, Jesus. And, and you hear what they're saying. and Turn it around, Lord. Switch it. And the heart of the king is in your hand. Oh, that's true. But we spend so much time praying for God to reduce the odds. We want everything in our favor. But here's a thought. Maybe God wants to stack the odds against us so we can experience miracles of divine proportion. That is what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You don't see it, but God says it can be. Our impossible situations are opportunities, y'all, to experience a new dimension of God's glory. You know, in Genesis 1, in the creation account, in verse 2, it says, Now the earth, watch this, was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And here it is. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the beginning, the Spirit of God was literally hovering over chaos. And, 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 and what God did is he brought order. He brought that which was good out of chaos. And God is still doing the same thing today. He's, he's hovering over that which we think is chaotic and problematic. And he's poised to bring order and bring something great out of that which we consider chaotic and problematic. And that phrase in the Hebrew, the spirit was hovering over the waters. That phrase, over the waters, in the Hebrew is panim. And panim is a two-dimensional Hebrew word. Panim refers to the, to the space of time in front of us and the space of time behind us. It, it, it refers to before something happens and after something happens. When it says that the Spirit of God was hovering, that literally means that what God does is he forms a parenthesis around our life. He is, he is there before we get there and he's behind us after we've left. And God performs this parenthesis around our life because he's walking with us. He's there with us ready to bring order and beauty and something magic, magical and magnificent out of that which is chaotic. That's what the psalmist says. Psalm 139, if I, if I look up ahead, you're there. If I look behind me, you're there. God hems us in. You remember when, when Satan says, I, I really want to mess with Job, but I can't get to him because you got a hedge. That's what God does. You think it's crazy, but God says, I got you hemmed in. I got you hedged in. I know what I'm doing. Just trust me. I love the way that uh, the theologian A.W. Tozier talks about this. He says that one of the most important things about you is what comes to mind when you think about God. That's so good. I'm going to say it again. He said, one of the most important things about you is what comes to mind when you think about God. Meaning, how you think about God will determine so much about your life. You're not just the byproduct of your situation or your circumstance. Oh, well, you don't understand, Bishop. This is what happened. No, 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 no. I understand that. I acknowledge that. I recognize that. But that doesn't determine your life. You are the byproduct of your God picture. What will determine so much about your life is this internal picture you have of God. How big is God to you? Is he able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you're able to ask, think, or imagine? Or do you have a small God? See, most of our problems are not circumstantial. Most of our problems are perceptual. Because we look at our problems and we think our problems are big because we're looking at God and we think God is small. But I'm here to tell you, our God is not small. He is the author and the creator. He, he, is, he is those who set the stars in the space. He is the one who said, let there be. And even if it wasn't before he said it, it had to be it because he did say it. That's the God we serve. And the truth is, if you've been walking with God for some time, the more you've been walking with God, the more God ought to grow. And the smaller your problems ought to get. The Bible says we go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. 
And as you've been walking with God, as he has been moving in your life, I may only be talking to 12 of you up in here, but, but, but you ought to have, have, have had a point of reference when you've seen God move here and seen him move there and seen him do some things here and seen him do some things here. You, you ought to be growing in your faith. Faith ought to be rising up so that when this next challenge comes up, you ought to say, hi, let me introduce you to my God because the same God that moved back here is the same God that's going to move here. The odds are not your issue. The issue is, how big is your God? And can I tell you something? When your God is big, you start praying big prayers. You start praying sun stand still kind of prayers. You start praying Jabez kind of prayers. Oh, bless me indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I really believe that when we pray those kind of prayers, God sticks his chest out. Because God says, okay, they, they, they really trust me. So you got to go for it. You got to ignore the odds. But then lastly, as I close, here's the thing. If you're going to go for it, you're going to have to unlearn your fears. And some of us may even have to repent. See, the thing about Beniah was that what he did, he did during the scariest moments of his life, but they were also the most defining moments of his life. And, and what this means for us is that sometimes the greatest breakthroughs of our life will happen when we push through fear. Now, this whole story revolves around Benaiah chasing a physical lion into a pit on a snowy day. And, and, and we often won't do that. Hopefully, we will never have to chase a physical lion. But the revelation is that so many of us are sidelined by mental lions. So many of us have, have, have stuff going on, stinking thinking in our mind that prevents us from experiencing everything that God has for us. A couple months ago, I was trying to upgrade, upgrade. I was trying to upgrade my computer to a, to a new operating system. Uh, I am, I am, I'm Apple Stolid. Y'all will catch that later. I'm Apple Stolid. And I was trying to upgrade, upgrade my computer to a new, new operating system. And I was trying to download the upgrade so that my computer could be more effective and efficient and do more graphically and, and in a number, of, a number of other ways. I wanted it to do more. And I was trying to upgrade and my computer crashed. I was trying to upgrade and it crashed. I was trying to upgrade and it crashed. I was trying to upgrade and it crashed. Yeah, I wanted to upgrade it, but it crashed. And so then I had to, I had to get Apple on the phone. And, and I said, now, 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 wait a minute now. I'm apostolic. I believe in you. Now, come on now. <laughs> What's the dealio? And they said, well, sir, um, um, what, what did you have on your computer before you tried to upgrade? And I told them I had these things on there. And they said, oh, that's the problem. They said, you have to uninstall that stuff before you can upgrade to the new. Because if you don't uninstall the old, it will make your computer crash because the new cannot commingle with the old. Oh my God, I hear God saying he cannot pour new wine in old wine skins. Some of you are trying to upgrade your life, but you got thoughts, you got a mindset that needs to be uninstalled. You got irrational fears and misconceptions that God says, we gotta uninstall that. You remember that man in, in John chapter five? that had been at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years and Jesus shows up and, and there's so much in that story we don't teach. Jesus has to step over everybody else to get to this man and Jesus gets there. Jesus the Christ, the kurios Christos, the weos to the, uh, the savior of the world is standing in front of this man and he says, do you want to be made whole? And then the man starts giving excuses. See, what had happened, Jesus, is see. I had been here 38 years and every time the pool was troubled, I had nobody to help me down into the pool and everybody got down into the pool ahead of me and see, I didn't grow up in the right environment. I didn't have the right access. I didn't have the right opportunities. He said, I didn't ask you all of that. Do you want to be made whole? He says, you got to uninstall all of that junk, all of that stinking thinking. And so Jesus just says, listen, man, pick up your mat and walk what I love is this Jesus doesn't touch the man Jesus doesn't spit on the ground make a paste and put it on the man's eyes Jesus doesn't even speak a command and say like he said to Lazarus you know come out of the grave he just says yo pick up your mat and walk what, what's this before Jesus could heal the man physically he had to heal the man mentally 
He's saying that a part of the reason you are paralyzed is because of your stinking thinking. Who am I preaching to? He's saying that when you get your mind right, when you line up your mind with my word, when you understand that you are not the product of your circumstances, you are my child, you are a king's kid, that you are an heir and a joint heir, take up your mat and walk. Here it is. I got to hurry up. According to scientific references, there are over somewhere around 2,000 fears. According to psychiatric and scientific references, there are about 2,000, maybe a little bit more than 2,000 classified fears. Now, here's the thing. When we are born, scientists have also proven that when a baby is born, we are only born with two fears. I think it's the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. We're only born with two fears, but there are over 2,000 or so classified fears. So then the question is, if we're only born with two fears, how do we get to this place where there are 2,000 plus fears? Because we've learned them. And the thing is, if you've learned fears, then guess what? You can unlearn them. <laughs> you can uninstall that fear. You can uninstall that fear. I did, a, I did a study one time because in scripture, God says over and over and over again, fear not, fear not, fear not. And I did a study. I said, I just want to track how many times God says fear not in the Bible. Guess what? God says fear not 365 times in the Bible. You missed it. For every day of the year, God is saying, I got you. Fear not. I got your marriage. Fear not. I got your finances. Fear not. I got, I got your kids. Fear not. I got your business. Fear not. Whatever the fear is that you are still grappling with, God says, uninstall it, unlearn it. I got you. Fear not. I, 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 I hear you. I, I'm closing, Pastor Matt. Some of you are thinking, but Bishop, I just, I hear you. But I just need a sign from the Lord. I need, I need, I need a sign. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that God's not going to give you a sign. Because if he gave you a sign, you wouldn't need faith. But what he will give you is he'll give you a word. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm talking to some of you and God has given you a word. But the question is, are you going to move at the word? One of my favorite stories in Matthew 14 and verse 22, let's close with this, is when Jesus sends the disciples in the boat. Around verse 22, he says that they got in the boat, and he says, y'all go to the other side. And when he sent them away, he went up onto the mountain to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone. And the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, watch this, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost, man. And they cried out in fear. There we go again. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, here it is, fear not. Don't be afraid. I love Peter. Peter is honest. He's like, hey, yo, is that really you? If that's you, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. Here it is. Jesus didn't say, it is me, Peter. It's me. Don't you see the locks in my hair? He didn't say any of that. He gives him one word. He says, God is speaking to some of you. He's giving you one word, come. He's giving you one word, come. For some of you, come to this ministry. For some of you, come here. For some of you, start this. For some of you, trust me. And I love it. He gives Peter one word, come. And it says, and when Peter come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. Peter gets to experience this miracle because he responded to the word. I wonder what move does God have waiting on you for you to respond? If you would just respond, what miracle is God waiting to perform? Y'all over here kind of quiet. Y'all the cynical people because y'all too deep. 
Y'all like, but see, Bishop, tell the rest of the story. <laughs> he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the waves and he sank. See, that's why I ain't coming because I ain't going to sink. I hear you. But can I tell you something? I think sinking and allowing the Lord to pull you up is better than sitting. I would much rather step out on faith and be as shaky as I want to be, knowing that if I sink, the master will reach out and grab me than to sit down and miss a move of God. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shores, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. You can't get that testimony if you're going to sit. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord. There, there, are, there, there, are, there, are, there, there are a couple of people in the world and you got to choose who you're going to be. They're risk takers and they're haters. The risk takers are the ones that get out the boat. The haters are the ones that sit in the boat and miss a move of God. And here's the thing about the haters. The haters will always comment on what the risk taker should have done differently. See, I would have made sure that I had my wetsuit on before I got out of that boat. But the haters will never experience a move of God. But I've come here to tell you, God has not called you to be a hater. He's called you to be a risk taker. Look at somebody and tell them, baby, you better go for it. You, you better strap your suit on, put your swim trunks on, get your floaty on if you need to, get a life jacket, baby, you better get out of that boat because God has got greater in store for you. And here's the thing for all of the haters, not y'all, but all of y'all haters who will have something to say when you get out of the boat and go for it. I don't understand why you chase a lion into a pit and you started your business and you did this. It doesn't make any sense to me. Here's the thing, the haters don't get the access that the risk takers get. Because, you know, when Peter got out of the boat later on, Peter is the same one that Jesus says, Peter, upon this rock, <laughs> I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter gets that commendation, not the haters, not the sitters. Peter gets it. And you know, Pastor Matt, we often preach that wrong because we talk about the gates of hell shall not prevail. But you know, gates are defensive mechanisms. You live in a gated community, it's because you want to keep some folk out. So, so Jesus says, um, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, upon your profession, upon your faith, I'm going to build something with you. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it, meaning that the enemy will set up roadblocks to try to prevent you from getting where you're supposed to go. But what you're supposed to do is strap on your crash helmet and go after it. I got to go, but I'm preaching to somebody that needs to hear this. The enemy's got some stuff behind the gate that he's been trying to keep from you. But God told me to tell you, put on your crash helmet, baby. It's time to go for it. It's time to go for it. It's time to go for it. If you receive this word, give God a crazy praise. Give him a praise like, I'm going for it. In my marriage, I'm going to go for it. In my finances, I'm going to go for it. 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 All things are possible to them that believe. Go for it. Don't settle. Break through every barrier the enemy's trying to put up. Put that crash helmet on, strap up, go for it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I thank you for this heart of receptivity. I thank you, Lord, because like Peter, you're calling some risk takers. Because God, that is what faith is. And without faith, it is impossible to please you. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways that we try to play it safe. For the ways, God, that we try to, to live a life beneath our purpose and our calling. You didn't call us 
to cower. You called us to lead. You didn't call us to shrink back. You called us to press in. Lord, I pray that every person under the sound of my voice, that they would hear your voice and that they would come. They would shake off complacency. They would shake off convenience. And they would trust you. Trust me. I hear the Lord saying, trust me. I know what the doctor said, but trust me. I know what the bankers have said, but trust me. If you would only trust me. Trust me. We're going to trust you, Lord, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. The people of God said, Amen.